Cole, this is one of my favourite fishing spots here and uh, it's a place where I um, often come but don't get enough fish. Right. Uh, what sort of species am I likely to find here where you've got the rock shelf and uh, you know, what would you suggest that I okay. uh, I'll fish here for? What you do Len, first of all as you can see it's a, it's a rock ledge we've got running around here and we've got fairly deep water. But the idea actually is to fish the edges because that's where you're going to get the food source swept in. Right. So I'd fish uh, the edges of the, uh, this horseshoe here um, and maybe use a drift for a float maybe for blackfish. And as you can see there's plenty of green weed on the rocks for blackies. And maybe uh, also don't forget you can cast out for your demersal species like snapper, tailor. And I reckon around that point there, uh, Len, there'd be a few kingfish because baitfish tend to gather on the points. So you might get a few kingfish on the points here. I've seen the odd guy pull out a drummer and it's, uh, it's in that sort of corner up there. You know, what are the sort of signs you look for when you want to fish for a drummer and what sort of bait am I best able to use with it? Yeah, drummers, uh, drummer and groper. Uh, this is prime location for drummer and groper the blue groper and also the brown groper and also black drummer and silver drummer. Uh, once again Len, uh, I would actually get down here early, get yourself some little red crabs mm. under the rocks or the mm. black crabs, great drummer fishing, have a sinker that slides right down to the hook and the reason we use that is so there's no snagging. Oh there's right, no snagging. so you haven't got the, the swivel uh, and right. the sinker, right. you've just got the hook, the sinker and uh, what sort of bait would I, would I use? Just pin the black crab on, throw it out and let's let it waft down gently through the, uh, through the current. And the thing you'll need to get the drummer on the bite is plenty of like bread and mash, pilchard mash, bread mash, uh, cereal mash right. like bran or pollard, just to get them on the chew. But uh, spots like the tip again, or anywhere around this area where you've got a bit of deep water, and don't make the mistake then of throwing too far out. The drummer are close into ah, the rock right. because that's their uh, refuge, and they'll always come back in towards the rocks. Brim, am I likely to catch brim here? Yep, brim, and you'll get the brim on the same gear as a drummer. Yeah. Get a sinker right down to the hook and just throw it out. Plenty of burly because uh, brim are definitely um, uh, what they call uh, feeders that just opportunist type feeders. Right. And a bit of burly will bring them in. And also live nippers work well here as well. You know, when you go right. and pump the nippers, maybe at the local lake and use them around here. Now, what about safety? What should, what should I be looking at here? Should I be wearing anything special on my feet? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Am I best to fish with two people? Or, uh, you know, what are the signs I've got to look for? Because I, I know a long time ago we were fishing down, at, uh, down in Sydney on the rocks. A wave hit on our left hand side, but, but, but what happened was the wave wrapped around the rocks and come from behind us. And we weren't really uh, ready for it. So uh, uh, what safety features or safety aspects do we need to take into consideration? Very true. Uh, as we've, you notice we've come down from a height down yeah. here. Well the first thing I do Len is stand up there for 10 minutes and watch the wave pattern. Right. And that gives you some idea. And another thing you look for is escape points. So in case you get, do get swept right. in, you know your escape points where it's not so turbulent. So if you do get washed in, you know you can swim straight to an escape point. If, yeah. Let's say that take the worst scenario, you do get washed in, don't try and swim against the current because the current will always take you away from the rocks mm -hmm. and then you can swim back into your predetermined safety exit. You're absolutely right, never ever fish the rocks alone. Always wear very strong footwear mm -hmm. with those metal plates on your feet because mm -hmm. rocks like this with the green weed are extremely slippery and it's not the wave that comes in that gets you, it's the wave going out that gets you. The wave right. that comes in will barrel you, and then when you're on your mm. back, it's the wave outgoing of the surge will take you over. Um, I would be very, as you can see, a day like today, yeah. then, I would give this a big miss. It's much yeah. too turbulent for an inexperienced rock fisher out there today. Well, to, to summarize, the, the point on that side there, correct, where there's yep. a bit of a gutter, That's right. you see the white water, yep. would be an ideal place absolutely, for the drummer. Yeah, absolutely ideal. And we're using kanji, crabs, uh, nippers. nippers and and maybe a, pil a whole pilcher on a set of gangs right. cast out beyond the rocks and the weed for snapper right. uh, tailor and I reckon there'd be odd, odd kingfish out and there of course well. we're using a pretty big rod uh, which yep. uh, with a firm butt on it so That's that you right. can lift up over That's the right. rocks and uh, also when you catch the fish you've got to know where to bring it in absolutely and don't forget no fish is worth dying for well that's absolutely so, right that's so, absolutely right and that's the time yeah. when people get washed in then when they're actually 
take their uh, focus off the sea yep. and look at the fish they're trying to bring in. But uh, the, you just got to look for rock ledges to bring it yep. in. And don't bring it in straight ahead of you, bring it into the side mm -hmm. so it gets washed up on the rocks. Look at the sea, when it's clear, go down and pick it up. So the drummer over there was a little bit choppier yep. and that. As we come in, there's a second gutter just yep. here. Good growth that's, for gutter, oh, that's or, black, a gr or drummer. That, uh, I've, I've seen them catch blackfish in there, yep. but they haven't been of big size. But as we come around to this part here, they get bigger. I know because I've observed it, exactly yeah. what you said, there is a sand bank, there's a big sand patch yeah. in there. And I've used mullet gut, and I've cast onto the sand bank, and because the mullet gut's a pretty tough sort of a bait. And a good smell to it as well. And there's a good smell, exactly. And then and uh, we've picked up brim, and of course we've been always very, very yeah. careful around yeah. the rocks to make sure yeah. that uh, uh, we don't lose, you know, yeah. don't lose a fish, don't lose your life. That's, That's the right. main thing. Exactly right. Okay, cut. Cole, this is a, a typical uh, situation where you've got a, a lake going out into a mouth of an estuary. In past uh, fishing experiences I've had, I know that I've been hooked up very, very well on some pretty big fish on that sand yeah. spit out there. I've also got some very good whiting. Now, that is by trial and experience and watching other people. And if, my favourite little trick is to, to ramage through the garbage bins of the holiday uh, caravan parks see to caught. see what's been caught. So uh, if I see whiting heads in there, I chase the whiting or yeah, flathead yeah, or flathead. Yeah. However, you know, I'm now a novice. I've got no experience. You've come to my spot. How do you read this water? Okay, uh, very, very important. We've got an outgoing, um, a huge lake right. which is feeding out to the ocean here. And you've got to remember that every outgoing tide, there's prawns, mullet, mm -hmm. bait fish, and Believe me, the predators will be waiting for them. Right. So you're getting jewfish, you're getting kingfish, you're getting bonito, you're getting tailor, all waiting for those poor baitfish to come mm. out, and they're going to get right into them. So what we've got to do, we've got to fish an outgoing tide, because that's when all the outpourings mm -hmm. come out, and that's for the predatory species. So a nice good run in the river when we get those big runs, uh, uh, after a lot of rain or after a big high tide, mm -hmm. we're getting a good flush out the river, I would be putting on flesh baits or maybe a live bait, throwing it out, and I guarantee you a dew off this sand spit here, Lynn, or maybe mm. even off the rocks. So mm. because there'd be predators galore waiting there for the uh, for the outpourings. I know that little sand spit that mm. just comes out the front there. Mm. I fished on the ocean side yep. uh, of this peninsula, and I've been in the water up to my knees with uh, beach worm, and yep. uh, I found that as I threw the sinker out, it tended to bounce down the sandbank as it washed away. Yeah. And I got some good size uh, whiting, yet I go on the rocks nothing. and I cast in the same spot yeah. and I thought I won't get wet, yeah. I get nothing. Yeah, yeah, very true. It's the wave action, isn't it? Well, wave action as well. And don't forget, if the whiting are off the rocks, Lynn, they're gonna get eaten. And they know that. So they just hang in and let, uh, by the side of the gutters in the eddies. So right. they get washed out to the predators. So you're dead right. This little sand spit here where we've got a nice little bit of uh, shallow water going into some deep gutters over there. The whiting are going to hold in there away from the outpourings of the lake. And you're dead right. Uh, this is obviously a, a great beach for beach worm, mm -hmm. uh, And I would use live beach worm or maybe blood worm on this beach for whiting. And you were right what you say when you said use a very, very light sinker and just let it bounce mm. through the gutters uh, naturally. A lot of people tend to throw out and anchor baits in sand mm. and it's quite important to let your bait go with the flow. Mm. A nice long metre trace so your worms are washing up and also it keeps it off the bottom away mm -hmm. from crabs and those little horrible um, flat stingrays mm. and let it wash along the gutters and let it find and that's where the whiting will be. Well, one of the great things about coming to a spot like this, that if it does get windy and uh, difficult to fish, you can always duck around That's right, yeah. to the uh, to the lakeside, into the lagoon, yep. and we'll go around there now yep. and, and, and just have a, look. have a look at it. Yeah. I mean, it's a, this is a great uh, a great fishing posse here. Mm. There's probably half a dozen mm. spots you could explore on the on the uh, the mouth of this lake here. Yeah. And of course, safety once again is a prime uh, is paramount because. Uh, that current can't run pretty quick absolutely. and you can get washed away. I've been down here and I've yeah. seen little kids on floats yeah. with their mums and dads screaming yeah. as their little kids being washed yeah, yeah. Out, to, out to sea. And another, another um, uh, inherent danger of course is standing on the sand and because the outpourings of course and the, the strength of the current it eats away the sand and you can actually drop yeah. into deep water so it's another thing you just yeah. got to be careful of. Yeah. And the final one 
you may be catching a fish a little bit bigger than you think oh, at the mouth of an estuary. There'll be some freight trains out there, mate, believe me, absolutely. Okay. Right. We're more inland now, Cole, from uh, the mouth of the, uh, the lake, and we start seeing sand spits, we start seeing large uh, sand flats, we've got soldier crabs, uh, we've got uh, yabbies, yep. we've even got some prawns because the prawns now are in amongst the weed beds and I've, I've actually uh, had a, th a fine net, just like a hand net, yep. and passed it through the weeds and you, and you get these little shrimp Yeah. and of course there's potty mullet, yep. uh, you can put, you know, put uh, potty mullet traps mm -hmm. out. But my favourite uh, species is the uh, blackfish. Right. And on the run-up tide, mm -hmm. they start to come up in the channels. Right. Now, uh, tell me more about how I can catch better fish, mm. having already been armed with some local knowledge. Okay. Uh, well, blackfish love those drop-offs. Right. You know, just on the drop-off, if you can just run your float down where it starts to go down uh, into slightly deeper water. Right, where the channel is. Yep. That's correct, that's correct. And you need a bit of, as you said, on the run-up tide, because you need a bit of flow for blackfish. Blackfish won't stay around in still right. water. So you need a bit of flow. And as you saw when we were back on the rocks, Len, you just take a bit of weed from there, because I wouldn't be sure how much weed there is in the lake, but the weed you can get off the rocks will be mm -hmm. ideal for here. First thing you've got to do is adjust your float, as you probably know, to find mm -hmm. the ideal depth. Mm -hmm. And when you get to it, you stay there. Heaps and heaps of weed on the hook. A lot of nigger fishermen or black fishermen only put a little bit of weed on the hook. You want to load the hook, the hook up because two things that'll do. It'll break off and give a bit of burly, and number two, it'll attract the bigger fish. Well, there's something I've learned. Yeah. I've always put, I've been, I've been on the more conservative side, yeah, and I thought, yeah. oh, a little bit will hook up better. And you get little fish. <laughs> well, that's a problem. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And, uh, the, uh, the other thing I've noticed about when I'm black fishing here, sometimes you get like a little eddy. Yep. You, like you, as you go around here, you'll see that you know, there's a, like a horseshoe. And you go down a little bit further and you'll see that there's a, there's a, there's a drop off and there's like a little eddy. Mm -hmm. And whilst the current is running, often you can pick up some very good flat, uh, some, uh, yeah. flathead and also blackfish yeah. that are in close in that hole. Yeah. Now, the water's not actually moving, but you're just outside the current in that little eddy. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the thing that I like about a spot like this, that it is safe fishing. Yeah. However, there's always that little surprise packet. Yeah. And I was fishing out there one day, just, just around where that little grassy knoll section is there. And uh, there was uh, rolled up a right nice big fat black snake <laughs> and I'd look at it and it'd look at me and I'd watch all these people coming yeah. past with dogs and things and and uh, I would say to them just uh, stand back from there leave mm. this animal right. alone yeah. don't try and kill it it's happy out there sunbaking and also you're in his area yep he's not in your area you're actually in his yep. area yeah and of course of, of course if, in amongst the weeds uh, sometimes you can get these little uh, biteys yeah. in, in amongst the weeds yeah. I, I don't know the exact term they use for it but you itch for weeks after yeah. it and it's yeah. So uh, it's when I fish, fish there... It's called pelican itch. Pelican itch, ah, and, right. Uh, you also, it's a little parasite, and actually it lays its eggs under your skin. And there's, it's not actually harmful, but it makes you scratch. And, uh, and the more you scratch, the, the more, more eggs exactly. you... Exactly. <laughs> and, and another problem with pelican itch is the fact that uh, it's very susceptible to when the lake is still, when there's small tides and it's not flushing properly. Uh, pelican itch is very prevalent. And when we get a lot of sun on the water, it tends to breed pelican right. itch. Yeah. Well, the things that I that I like to do when I catch a fish and when I go to clean it, I have a look inside its stomach, yep. see what it's feeding on. Very important. And uh, one of the things that it was told to me yeah. about the lake up here is that the blackfish would go up and feed way up into the uh, far reaches of the lake mm. and uh, it would eat this uh, type of weed which I believe now is a noxious weed. So uh, the blackfish play a very important role and so do the other fish when they go up into the estuaries, they spawn, uh, they feed off um, organisms, they control the environment, the water, they oh, filter. Absolutely. So uh, we need to have a very healthy respect because yeah. I've been out there and you could catch 50, 60 blackfish quite yeah, easily. Absolutely. Uh, but you only really need to keep... Keep a few. Yeah. Because it's, it's all their own micro-environment out there. Yep. And the blackfish are a very important part of the lake, of course. Um, and I do recommend that you just keep enough for the table. Uh, when the blackfish are on, you can get 50 or 60, but you'll okay. never eat them. Okay, Cole, I've been out here, I've, I've snorkeled, mm. and I've seen whiting as big as salmon. Yeah. 
and no matter what I do, they will not take the hook. Yeah. Why? Because they're smart, Len. Ah, right. They're smart. Well, they are South Coast fish. You've got to remember, all the dumb fish have been caught. <laughs> Uh, it's only the smart ones are left, and that's why they're big, because they're smart. Um, the way to fish for whiting, uh, big whiting, is when there's cloud cover like we've got today, or early morning or late evening. Unweighted, completely unweighted, a worm travelling down. Right. It just won't go for the big sinker, big hook, stale bait approach. They're right. too smart for that. That's why they got big len, you know? But isn't it a wonderful spot here to oh, do some just, saltwater fly? Oh, it's saltwater hey? fly. And also, I can imagine I could spend a day just wandering around with the new soft plastics yep. or the hard-bodied lures, just working all the little eddies, working the tide up, and working we the tide down. And we haven't even talked about the flathead. And we haven't even talked about the flathead yet, that's yeah. right. We've got a whole day just wandering around here, yeah. just uh, with our spin rod or our fly rod, yeah. a, a pack of lures around us, uh, a bottle of water to keep refreshed, sun hat, sunny. Exactly. It'd just be a magic day to spend wandering. This is just a, a beautiful little estuary. And you can see by the water, it's a pristine estuary as well. And it's so typical of what we see along our yeah, eastern coast. We're so lucky. Okay, here we are at a typical beach formation here. And as you can see, we've got white water coming in and there's white water breaking probably 150 metres out from the beach and then rolling across deeper water and then breaking on the shore. Our ideal fishing spot is between the shore and the white water that's breaking out. We're fishing this deep part of the water here and as you can see there's actually darker patches of water which indicate even deeper water. Holes, gutters, gutters running out to sea and also water coming in. On this beach we can catch whiting, we can catch brim, we can catch tailor and we can catch salmon and we can even catch jewfish. It's a superb beach for all those species. Baits I would use here would be pilchard, it'd be worm baits, definitely worm like live beach worm or live blood worm. Nippers would go down very well here as well and of course fishing the really deep gutters in the evening, live bait or a big slab of tailor for jewfish. The secret of catching fish on the beach is to be a nomad. Have a belt and have your sinkers a variety of sinkers, a variety of bait round your, on, on your belt in buckets and walk the beach. Try a gutter. If it doesn't work, move on to the next gutter. If that doesn't work, move on to the next gutter. And don't forget as the tide comes in, a gutter that didn't fire also might start firing. So go back to those gutters. Don't just plonk and fish the session in the same spot. It's very important that you move up and down the beach. The successful beach fisherman is the nomad. They're the people that catch the fish. Um, if you're after the whiting, it's quite important to actually fish the shallow areas because the whiting will come up out of the gutters and as the tide comes in, they work across the shallow areas looking for tardy crustaceans like worms, shells, etc. So what we do is we cast onto the sandbanks and we let our bait and our rig work across the sandbanks. Nice long trace, a metre long trace, and we keep the bait moving. And that's in our quest for whiting. If we're after brim, brim tend to stay in the deeper water, the deeper gutters. Uh, they like the protection of white water and also to dig where the drop off is from the sandbank into the gutter. So that's what we'll target for brim. We actually start cast on the sandbank and let our sinkers roll into the deeper gutters. That's for brim. For jewfish, we want to actually leave our bait in the deeper gutters because the jewfish come in looking for bait fish in the deeper gutters and we have to keep our bait in that deep gutters because they won't go into shallow water looking for food. And it's in those deep gutters that the bait fish tend to gather because they're wary of predators like tailor, salmon and jew. So that's what we want to do. We want to actually put our slab bait or our live bait in that deep gutter, probably about half a metre trace. Nice big hook, because you've got to remember, jewfish have got huge mouths. So don't be miserly on hook size. 8, 10, 12 o hooks. That's what you need for jew. And of course, for simple tailor, the old pilchard on a ganged hook, three hooks through the pilchard. And once again, fish the deeper water, very important for Taylor, keep it moving. Cast in, flick, 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 keep the bait on the move. Taylor won't go for stationary baits because they're after bait fish. So keep the bait on the move. Very important for Taylor. See behind me, we've got a beautiful rock formation. 
And what we're going to fish for today is probably salmon off that point in the corner. You see the wash coming in? We've got the rock one side and we've got the beach the other. And that's where we're going to be fishing for our salmon. There's uh, some beautiful waves coming at the moment. It's a bit strong at the moment actually to rockfish, a bit dangerous to rockfish. But that's where I'll be casting out and just letting my baits work the white water for salmon because salmon absolutely love white water. If you pan around now and have a look at the rocks, it's absolutely ideal for blackfish or luderick. The, uh, the whole area there has got kanji, it's got weed, and although the ocean's a bit up at the moment, and it's a bit dangerous, I do recommend you wear very strong footwear with those metal uh, rock plates, cleats, because the rocks get very slippery with weed. But this is a very popular spot for black fishermen along here. A fixed float, when you get your fish, you bring it in, you slide it up over the kanji and back in. Uh, what we're going to do now, we're just going to go down there, because we can't fish the rocks today, the seas are a bit big, but we're going to go down there, gather some weed up and go back to the lake and fish. Let's go down and get some weed I've just gathered up. my bait now from the rock ledges and I've been very careful making sure that our safety is paramount and I've just grabbed some great silk weed from the rocks here. This weed here is great blackfish weed and this is called silk or stringy weed. Perfect for blackfish and there have been plenty of it on the rocks. So what I'm going to do, I'm now going to take this magic bait and as you can see it's pure green, it's got a lovely sea smell to it and within the, in, within the actual weed itself there's little crustaceans that have actually adhered itself to the weed. This is perfect blackfish bait. We'll take this back to the lake, we'll rig up and let's see if we can hook ourselves a blackfish, eh? There's a, there's a couple of big sets coming in now, Lynn. This is going to be have some great lift into it. Oh, mate, look at this. Look at this, Lynn. Boom. Whoa. Did you get it? <laughs> oh, mate. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't spectacular. No. Yeah. Mate, you do not fish here. This is quite dangerous water here, and we definitely don't want to fish here. Now, you blokes are out there surfing this area a fair bit, and I know you duck, dive under waves and that sort of thing. What sort of fish have you seen around here? Mainly the salmon. The old Australian salmon, eh? Beautiful. Plenty of them? Tons of them. La uh, well, last winter, when was it? Eric? August. August, so, you know, probably 100, 200, all about that size. Oh, magic, Up magic. And how close to the shoreline of the salmon? Right under the rocks, right underneath the reef. You, you can see them swimming around underneath there, and they go out, but mainly in a, underneath these, the shelf here. So they're really... And around in here. So they're really close in? Yep. So you reckon most blokes would cast past them? Could do. Yeah, yeah, so you've got to keep riding close to the rocks yep. to get the salmon. Just don't get snagged. Don't get snagged, that's right, yeah. Have you seen any other fish besides salmon around here? Just some brim and, and, um, and some flatties, I suppose. But no, yeah, probably tailor when they're running. Yep, yep. It's only the, sna uh, the, the salmon that we saw. The salmon, on that, yeah. Because we have uh, we found some great uh, luderick, as you said, some blackfish along here as well. Yeah. Because the weed here on the rocks, they right. get attracted to it. Yeah, and of course this is a per a good surfing spot. You get some good breaks here, don't you? Ah, uh, it's terrible here, mate. No one, has, <laughs> no one should come here to surf at all. I promise you, we won't. We won't reveal the place. I promise. <laughs> thanks, boys. All right, thanks. Take very care. Much. It's amazing, you know. I did mention before how important fresh bait is, and we've come down here to gather some weed. And after the rough seas we've had, I've just found some superb bait on the rocks. It looks like uh, some dog droppings, but in fact this is kanjivoy, or known, abbreviated as kanji. And uh, it's an excellent bait. We can actually break it off with a sharp knife, cut it, and it's excellent blackfish bait, and also groper bait, and also drummer bait. So it's amazing what sort of bait you do find on the rocks. And I do recommend that if you want fish, you've got to have fresh bait and there's none fresher than gathering your own bait. Uh, it's very important when you're on the rocks or you're bait gathering, you want to keep mobile. And a lot of people take a bucket with them when they go bait gathering, and this doesn't give you mobility, especially if there's a problem and you get actually a sea come in, you've got to remember where your bucket is and grab it. 
What I use is an old milk carton cut down, very, very cheap. And I can put my bait in here and it gives me full mobility on the rocks. I can put my worms in if I'm beach worming or we're gonna go and get some, um, some cabbage off the rocks now. And I can put it in here and I can keep my eye on the sea and at any danger, I can just make a run for it. Uh, it's a, a great idea and of course, it's a lot cheaper than buying those fancy bait buckets. Cost me about, uh, what, dollar fifty, and I've used the milk in it as well. Hmm? Okay, you notice also that I'm wearing nice strong footwear with the rocks, plenty of grip, so I can get close to slippery areas. Very, very important on the rocks to wear footwear that's uh, strong and also is adequate for the situation. A lot of people go on the rocks in thongs or running shoes and there's no grip at all. And the thing is you want grip because when a wave hits you, you want to lower your center of gravity and make sure you've got strong footwear because as soon as you're upended, you're at the mercy of the waves. And it's not the wave coming in that gets you, it's the one that goes out. So what I've got here is a, is a basic spinning thread line reel and I've got that new cyber thread. I'm using Fireline on it because I find it casts better and also I've got a direct feel of the lure back to my reel. So I can see exactly the action that the, that the lure is doing, which is very, very important. The reel basically is like, we call them egg beaters, because as you can see, when you wind them, they've got a, like an egg beater action. But the good thing about egg beaters, they're very, very easy to use. And secondly, they can cast very, very light lures. We have a bail arm, which we open and it's now ready for casting. On top of it, we have a drag setting, and this alters the friction. And we set the drag according to the braking strain of the line. A handle, so we've got left and right wind. I prefer the left, some people prefer to have it on the right. And lastly, we've got a little ratchet underneath here. And by having that on and off, I can, turn the reel left and right, I throw the ratchet and it stops me back winding the reel. Another beautiful thing about the Threadline reel, it is so popular, parts, maintenance is very, very easy. And if you fish salt water, it's very, very important that after a fishing session, you wash down all your equipment. When I'm going back to the drag again, it's very, very important to set the drag for roughly a third of the braking strain of the line. So if I'm using, say, nine kilo line, I want three kilos of braking strain. Now, I know that sound does, doesn't sound very much, but the reason for that is the fact that when you've got a lot of line out, the braking strain actually drops on the line. So it's very, very important, and you can set this by using a spring balance. And also, you notice the tackle I'm using. It's good quality tackle, and the balance is perfect. So. By holding it in my hand, you can see I've got a balanced outfit here, a very, very light spinning rod, and I can work the flats all around here for flathead, for brim, all day without getting a sore wrist. It's very, very ergonomic to work with. Another beautiful thing about these reels is they have an anti-line twist roller. And this anti-line twist roller, the first thing it does, it stops the line twisting, which is the bane of any fisherman and eventually it starts wrapping around the rod or when you cast, you get a lump of line come out, which is really annoying. But this roller actually reduces line twist by about 80%. At the end of a spinning session, you still have to actually unravel all your line on the lawn or run it behind the boat to get the twist out of it. But these new rollers really do eliminate line twist. And I recommend when you're looking for a quality thread line, make sure you look one with an anti-twist roller. A good thread line as well has got ball bearings. It's got a ball bearing down the central shaft, it's got a ball bearing in the handle, and also it's got a ball bearing where the handle goes in to the main body. You can see a quality reel like this has got a bump protection, so when you're fishing the rocks, it gets protected. And also another good thing about this reel, it's made out of fairly durable alloy, so it can take a few knocks. They do need maintenance and I recommend how often you fish, maybe if you're fishing say every week, that you take off the top 30 meters of line and re-shot it with brand new line because line is your only connection to the fish. 
and it's most important that we keep that perfect. What I've got here is Fireline, which is one of the new cyber threads. It's a product of the space race. The beautiful thing about this Fireline is the fact that it's got no stretch at all. Very, very important when you're fishing lures, because you can actually see the action of the lure. The downside to this, of course, it puts a lot of strain on the rod. Because there's no stretch at all, like mono, when you catch a fish, all the loading goes on the rod. So you've got to make sure your drag is set perfectly. As it's a very, very slippery line, you have to learn probably two or three knots to tie this fire line. But they come, when you buy a spool of this fire line, in the directions on the line, it tells you how to tie these new knots. I like using it for spinning, deep water fishing because you get an actual feel of it on the bait. Going back to mono, which is the old fashioned nylon line, it's got the cushioning or the stretch. And that's nice if you're not proficient in fighting fish. It gives you a bit more leeway and doesn't put as much strain right on the rod. Another good thing about mono, of course, it can be cut with, you're using your teeth, which I don't recommend, or maybe just a, uh, a pair of scissors. With Fireline, you have to use scissors and be very, very careful with Fireline because it's so strong and so thin, it's like a cheese cutter and it can cut through wet flesh very, very easily. So be very careful when you're using Fireline and your hands are wet because you can inflict some nasty damage. As you can see, I've got the bail arm open, ready to casting, and I've got my finger very, very lightly pressing against the spool with the line trapped against my finger. Now this is ready for a cast and at the top of the cast when the rod's fully loaded I just let my finger go and it releases the line and I get a nice parabolic cast. What we got here is an overhead reel and the thing about the overheads is they sit on top of the rod or overhead the rod, over on top of the rod. They don't fish down below the rod, they fish on top of the rod, like so. Um, now the overhead reel gives a direct pull on the fish. As you can see, the line goes through here and we've got a direct tension on the fish here. Uh, I, do you want to hold that? Thanks, mate. We've got a... Basically, the reel has got a thumb bar and by pulling that thumb bar, it releases the spool ready for casting. By turning the handle, we re-engage the thumb bar. This star drag is my drag, which once again we do up to a third of the breaking strain of the line. And we can adjust the actual spool tension by the spool tension knob, which is here. Very, very simple to use, but I do suggest you practice casting because you need thumb control on these. So when you cast it, you've got to make sure that the thumb is on top of the reel. And don't let it go because you'll end up with some horrific bird's nests. A lot of people fight shy of these because of the bird's nest. But I do recommend that you do give these a go because when you actually feel a direct pull of a fish on one of these, it's so much better than a thread line. But you need heavier lures or heavier casting tackle because you need the momentum of the lure to actually start to get the drum to revolve. Uh, revolve. What I want to do, I want to set this reel now for casting. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to adjust the reel tension, <laughs> tensioning, doesn't matter, the reel tensioning screw here until the reel just turns when it drops to the ground. A bit more. And it's just turning as the sinker hits the ground. Now that is set now for casting. And theoretically, I shouldn't get, I can put the drag back on and I shouldn't get any bird's nest, theoretically. But I do suggest you do go out and practice because you've got to train this thumb to work on the reel. Here I have my star drag. And what I'm going to do, I want to set it to approximately a third of the breaking strain of the line again. So once again, if we're using nine kilo line, I want to set this for approximately three kilos of drag. And I do this by setting the star drag here. Now the, red, the reel, rod and reel is now ready for casting. What we do now, we go into a field and we practice. What I'm going to show you here now is a blood knot. Actually, it's a locking blood knot, which is probably the one knot you're going to use 99% of the time. It can tie hooks, it can tie swivels, 
it can tie line to line, and it can tie sinkers. And the blood knot is very, very simple. What we do, we put the line through the eye of the hook and give ourselves a nice long tag. And I then do four or five wraps round the line, like so. And then I put my tag end through my original hole and then tighten up. And that is called a blood knot. But I'm going to, as I said, I don't recommend you use a blood knot, I recommend you use a locking blood knot. This is a knot that I don't recommend also for gel spun line. You need to learn a different knot, which we'll show later in the series. But a locking blood knot, once again, nice long tag end. One, two, three, four, five times around through the original hole. And we've now made a loop there. And once again, we go through the loop and then we tighten up. And this is now a locked blood knot and that will not slip. And the beautiful thing about this, this will still give about 98% of your line strength because as you know knots weaken line but this gives still about 98 percent of your line strength a very recommended knot one thing i didn't show you before you tighten up always very good to put some spit on it and then tighten it up and this stops heat building up in the line when you tighten up the locking blood knot once again 99 percent what i'm going to do i'm going to join these two lines together once again they're of similar thickness and the simple way of doing it is just a blood knot or a locking blood knot to locking blood knot. So we take this line here, we go one, two, three, four, through the original hole and then back through the loop and we, and we tighten up with a bit of spit. And then we do the same with this one here. We go one, two, three, four, five through the hole and then back through the hole we've made tighten up a bit of spit and tighten up and here we have joined we trim the ends and we've now got a blood knot to blood knot this is a very very strong knot and still keeps 98 percent of the line strength do you want to hold that for me just hold it about there, keep it still. Okay. The first thing we do is we put an overhand knot, like so. Then we put the line through the lure. And then we go through the loop we've just made. Wrap it round about three times, two, three, and then back through the hole we made originally. What I'm going to show you now is a loop knot which you put onto lures and the reason we're using a loop knot because if you use a swivel or a snap swivel especially on smaller lures it kills that very very important action that the manufacturers spend millions in trying to get into lures and you really want lures to strut their stuff so what I'm going to show you now is a special loop knot to work and also attach your lures the first thing we do is we make an overhand knot and after we've made our overhand knot, we then thread the tag end through the lure. And then we come over the top of the overhand knot. And we go roughly one, two, three times around the main line. And then back underneath, like the rabbit coming through the hole, back out through the original loop. And then we actually wet the whole thing, tighten up the knot, and there we have a loop knot. Now this loop knot, once again, will keep 80% of line strength. And as you can see, the lure now is completely free to strut its stuff. Excellent. What we're gonna show you today is a dropper knot. This is a knot used where you've actually got droppers off the main line. And you can put one, two, three, four, as many droppers as you like. A very, very simple knot, and the beautiful thing about this knot is the dropper then stands proud on the line, 
so it's not tangling up with the main line. And you can put, as I said, two, three, four, and once again, we haven't uh, weakened the line at all by doing this knot. Yep. There's a growing trend today to soft plastics. And the beautiful things about these soft plastics is they actually look like bait fish, are soft and give the same movement as bait fish. Then we can impart the movement through rod action. But as you can see, they're lovely and soft. And when a fish mouths one of these, it's, as opposed to hard bodied lures, where they'll mouth it, feel it's hard and then eject it, with soft plastics, the take is over a longer period because they'll mouth it and they'll think it's actually a bait fish. So you've got a that slight bit longer with the hook in the, in the hook in the fish's mouth to strike. Here's a couple of examples of soft plastics. And what I'll show you now is how to rig them. It's very, very important that we use the right head or the right jig head on the soft plastic. Now what I want to do, I want to fish this soft plastic mainly near the bottom. So I'm using a fairly heavy jig head as you can see. And this is going to go straight down the two, three, go. Okay. So what I'm going to show you today is how to rig a jig head onto a plastic. It's very, very important that when we actually feed the jig head onto the plastic is that we make sure where exactly we want the hook to come out. So I need the hook to come out here just about two or three millimeters from the fin here. So I start feeding the soft plastic through the bait feeding it up the hook and then when the hook comes out two or three mils near the fin I then feed the soft plastic over the holding little claw here <coughs> and then adjust it so it's nice and flat it's not balanced your line's too heavy you haven't got enough line on your reel or your rod's too stiff, okay. you're not going to be able to propel loaded your rod. When using soft plastics, it's a great temptation to cast out and then just wind back in. But when you're actually fishing soft plastics, treat them like bait and actually retrieve at this sort of rate. Then leave it, then maybe a quick flick of the rod and then maybe another half a wind and then the rod up and down, half a wind and then leave it for two or three seconds and then another half wind and then a flick and then another half wind and you can see how slowly I'm working this soft plastic now flick flick half a wind up up side side then I leave it for two or three seconds now it looks like an injured bait fish and that's what a soft plastic should look like an injured bait fish because fish will never go for bait fish that are well because they can't catch them they're actually after injured bait fish. And by doing this flick, flick, half a wind, stop, stop, flick, flick, we're actually mimicking an it's, injured bait fish. I'm normally using generally a duller lure. On a, on a brighter day, I might use something that's a couple of tones lighter. Yep, yep. But I won't normally go to a, a fluoro or a, a something very bright. I don't yeah. particularly like it, something very, very bright. Yeah, yeah. Because I find with hard bodied lures, I use dull lures on dull days, bright lures on bright days and work from that downwards. Uh, sometimes when the water's got a bit of cloud in it, you need to use uh, lures with a bit of a rattle in so it's got a, um, uh, a sound so you make up for the dark water. But unfortunately with soft plastics, you're just reliant on noise from the tail fin, aren't you? Yeah, you get, you get vibration though, you pick up a lot of vibration. If you've got a, um, a nice little plastic, it's got a, a quick uh, vibration in its tail and your head your head makes a big difference to that. Yeah, yeah. Because if it's if it's sinking too slowly, that tail's not going to work as much. Right. But by the same token, you've got something too heavy, it's just going to plummet. Yeah. And the tail's going to have no effect anyway. Right. So you've got to balance your, your head to the size of the body and the tail of the, of the plastic that you're using. So, Paul, are you looking for neutral buoyancy in a soft plastic? No. So something that, or, or something that sinks slowly? Something that'll, that'll flutter down yeah. at, a, at a reasonable pace, but not plummeting down. Something yeah. that'll get that little tail moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a nice little something with a nice little, especially little paddle tail or a nice little curly tail. As it's go, as it's dropping, that's when the fish generally hit them anyway. On the so way down. On the way down. Right. They don't necessarily hit them on the on the. Sure, up. sure. Most of the times they hit on the drop. Yeah. 
And do you find that the main problem with soft plastics is that people tend to wind too fast? Oh yeah, they operate them too fast. Yeah. All your reel does is pick up the slack. Right. Your rod does the work. Right. And the only time the reel really comes into effect is when you're fighting the fish. Yeah. It's just picking up the slack, that's all it's doing. Very important with soft plastics. Work them slow. And I'm going to have a go for some flatties. And I've selected this little lure here. Plenty of action in the tail, big paddle tail here. A fairly heavy head because I want to keep it on the bottom. And you notice I've tied it on with a Harrison loop knot so the lure can fully strut its stuff. It's not restricted by a snap swivel or tying the lure directly onto the eye here. Now what I want to do, I'm actually going to push it through the weeds. A lot of rod action to get that tail moving. As you can see, a lot of action in that tail. So I'm going to be actually trolling it through the weeds. Stop, a little flick, troll, little flick, troll and try and get as much action as possible out this little plastic here. Just where the weeds and the sand mix, um, there's a fair bit of weed out there, that's why this lure is going to travel hook up, so I shouldn't get snagged up too much. And let's see if we can go and get ourselves a flathead. We're down here uh, fishing this lake and I'm with my special mate here, Lenny Pasco. I grew up uh, black fishing, uh, ludric fishing at Narrabeen Lakes, yep. uh, which is your old stamping ground. Or Absolutely, your current stamping yep. ground. yeah, the old northern beaches. And uh, I, w I was always taught that you use a centre pin rent reel like yep. this one. Yeah. And uh, the idea is that you can peel off the line and you let the line drift away from you if you're in a boat or you cast to your left uh, and then you let it drift along. Mm. However, uh, it has its limitations that you've got the wind that blows uh, into your face and you can't cast as far. And in places like this here, uh, you need to get out into the channel. You need to go on uh, just the edge of the weed patch right. where there's the sand patches and you need your bait to float over the top of that and yep. the blackfish come out of the reeds to attack it. They're in the main channel. Mm. So this particular reel um, is a very good reel, very good for boat fishing, still water fishing, yep. somewhere where you don't have to cast very far. So, uh, but this particular one is a rig that, uh, that I use. Yep. Uh, and you'll notice that it's a thread line. Yeah, which is interesting, Len. It's a thread line reel. Yeah. And the rig is very simple. Now you've used this rig down here for quite a few years now, I believe. Yeah, I, I come down here, uh, as old fellow called Sid and Harry and mm. Bert, and they saw me arrive with the centre pin rim, yep. reel, and they thought that uh, I was some sort of a uh, young gunslinger in town. <laughs> and a, they city, a city slicker in the country, eh? Yeah, yeah. So what's this bloke doing? And uh. these, these guys are all using rigs like yeah. this. And um, a little drop loop on the, on the hook yep. like this allows the weed or the cabbage to just to stay on a little bit, yep. a little bit better. The hook itself is only a very small hook. Yeah, and also I notice it's green in colour which I think is quite important because it then camouflages itself into the bait. That, that's right, and it's one of those chemically sharpened hooks with the little barbs on the back yep. also to help uh, keep the bait on. Uh, the, the line here is very critical because you're casting a long distance. It's very, very uh, possible that the line tangles over the, yeah. 
the top oh, of the which is, uh, mate, I've gone through that, Len. It's really annoying. Uh, exactly. Really annoying. So normally speaking, we have a, uh, a shorter tail. Yep. But today it's not real windy and we've gone for this type of rig. So yeah. typical rig, you've got a plastic stopper just here. Yeah, and that you stops the float. The tackle shop. I see. So when you, ca you cast in and the float slides up to that stopper and gives you a predetermined depth. That's correct. Yep. That's correct. And, and, and also if the fish is, sometimes the fish is actually coming upwards. Yep. Yep. And uh, the, the, the float is... Uh, is, is, is sort of on an angle like that. So you don't actually get downs on the float, you also get ups as you well. You get ups as well, yeah. Right, that's interesting. Then, it, it, uh, the way you've leaded this line fascinates me. You know, I know a leading line is very important. You've got a lead immediately under the float, and you've got a couple of pieces of lead halfway down and three quarters of the way down the line. Just explain that to me. Well, the reason for that is that I want the bait to be reasonably uh, static as it yep. goes through the water at a consistent height. Yep. So you've, you've, you're going over weed beds and you, you don't want to be catching all the time on the weed beds. So if you could imagine the weed beds here, yep. the sink is about here. The line is sort of like that with the current and uh, also it keeps the, uh, the float more upright. And because I don't want a lot of lead here, I put a heavier lead above the swivel. Right. So that uh, I can cast out, because you need to have the weight oh, I to see. cast out. So it's your casting mass as well. That's correct. To give you inertia. Yep, That's I got you. But the, hence why we use the, uh, the thread line uh, spinning reel, so that we can cast uh, quite easily, retrieve quickly, because your line might be 30, 40, 50 metres out right. there, yeah. uh, you know, when you're working the drift. The other thing that's very important is that we only want to see the tip of the red uh, section of the float in the water. Yep. It's like that. In some cases, you might only have that much. Is that because of less resistance or when the actual blackfish grabs it, there's less resistance when he's sucking on the weed? That is absolutely correct. We don't want to let the uh, fish know that um, uh, there's, a, there's a weight at the end of it. Mm. And mm. also, the more sensitive it is, the more uh, uh, you can uh, detect if there's a, if there's yep. a bite. Yep. And the blackfish sometimes, what they do is they suck the, the weed in and then blow it out. All oh, right. Uh, they don't right. actually bite like yep. a uh, like, like a, a conventional fish. Yeah, 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 yeah. So sometimes they suck at it. Sometimes they'll nibble at the side. Yeah. Uh, they can be very, very cagey. Yeah. Okay. And also another good thing about it, uh, another important thing, Len, I would imagine about only having that much uh, float showing is there's less windage on the float, so the wind doesn't affect the float. Am I right there? That, that's correct. That's correct. The, the good black fishermen, uh, they, they will detect the slightest movement. The, the float might go down just a fraction and, and it, you develop like a sixth sense. Yeah. There's something happening around here. The novice comes up there and they just get bored and they, they don't think anything of it. Yeah. But uh, the, the true black fishermen, uh, they will know when there's a bite about to happen uh, just by the interest around the tip of that float. Right, right. There, there's a couple of other things I want to uh, yeah, bring sure. to uh, your attention. What I do is I use a keeper net yep. and I've got the white plunger. Yep. The plunger goes down into the ground Yep. and I use long handled landing a net. catching net yep. because when those blackfish come up they want to dive into those reeds yeah yeah so you want to get in there especially those big ones there's, yep. there's some real whoppers in there yeah and you get in there get it underneath and once you've got it in the net you're able to put your rod in here oh i see yep yep okay then take the fish out so your rod sticks in, in here net. that gets it out of your hands that's right and you can just use a net that's right. good idea and excellent that way you don't have to be walking in yeah. and out and in and out and finally wearing those um the waders the waders is yeah. a real good idea out there uh, you avoid the pelican itch, yep. and also uh, you avoid uh, yep. cold feet. And of course, you you don't want to be treading onto uh, uh, those conical shells or yes, yeah, fortescues, absolutely. Like and I notice also when you're actually fishing, your net actually goes in there, it's stored That's in correct. there. Yep. And we put the net in there like that, and you're self-contained. I see. Yep. Absolutely. You don't have to keep going back to shore to get stuff and your net and your your, your weed. You're, That's right. You're totally self-contained. All Stay right. Cole, there's um, two types of baits that we use out here. One is the uh, traditional cabbage yep. uh, weed or cabbage, and you just put the hook on. And uh, I, I noticed you were doing a clinic the other day, and you're talking about putting plenty of uh, uh, of bait on. Now, that's, that's a right. good idea, and uh, the fact that you get bits of burl. Yeah. And, and, and a big fish is not going to take a small bit. That's right. It? I'm a great believer, mate. Big baits, big fish. So there, there's, there, there it is. That's how simple that was. Right. right. So I know a lot of people, Len, they spend hours winding and winding the cabbage round. You don't have to do that. Not with cabbage, no. Yep. Two or three times there's a hard section in the cabbage there where it's near, where it's uh, attached to the rocks. And right, you put it okay. through there once or twice and that's enough. The second type of uh, bait they use down here uh, is the weed. The old uh, stringy weed, yeah. The old stringy weed. And the black fishermen, 
they're, they're amazing. Uh, a certain type of weed won't work in a certain area and uh, when they uh, pick a spot where a weed works, they won't tell anyone where they're getting it from and they won't tell them what, what the weed is. It's the magic bait. <laughs> the magic bait. And the idea is we had a loop put into this, the yep. same way as you tie a lure in. Yep. And the, and, and the idea is that you pass the, the weed uh, through, the, through the little loop here yep. and then you, you wind one, two, three, one way and then you wind one, two, three, the other way and then you leave a little bit of a tail. So you leave a nice long beard. That's we call right. it beard to the to the bait. Yeah. And then in comes the in comes the ludric. Yep. It says, oh gee, that's not a bad bit. And and they, they suck it in there like that. Bang, gone. away you go. And then down, down comes the float. You want to give it a go? Mate, let's go fishing, eh? Absolutely. <laughs> let's go. One of the things I like to do, Cole, is uh, throw in sand. Yep. Uh, when you think about it, the uh, Ludric, uh, when they're off the rocks, they see a lot of uh, action around the gutters. There's a lot of white water, there's bits and pieces being um, washed in, it's cloudy. And uh, they're looking for uh, floaties, uh, bits of weed, bits of uh, cabbage are coming through. Yep. Now I'm going to throw some sand out uh, near your float. Uh, yeah, I, look, I, I don't have to put weed with it, I don't have to do anything with it. I just picked up sand that's from around the local area. Right. And uh, that action of the sand tends to uh, get them in a bit of a feeding frenzy. Yeah, okay. This is a top fishing day. The sun's out, there are people on the banks, people in boats. That's a top time to be catching um, this species of fish. As we were saying before, Colin's uh, working the, uh, the channels, he's working the edge of the weeds, he's throwing in uh, lots of burley. We've already had about uh, uh, four good solid downs and uh, we know the fish are there, we know they're feeding, uh, but they are uh, fairly intelligent. The tide's coming in, so that's important. Uh, when they're coming in, uh, the tide's coming in, the fish are actually going up well, in the lake. Well, it's been the most fantastic day. We've been out there for a, probably for an hour or so. We've had plenty of downs, but unfortunately we haven't hooked a fish yet. So we're obviously doing something that's not quite right. So we decided we're gonna break for lunch, have a bit of, de have a bit of a debrief, and then uh, gather our thoughts, get out there. I think it's actually lack of run. We're th actually throwing out and our float staying there. We need a bit of run. As they say, no run, no fun. So we'll have a bit of lunch. And then this we'll is the sort of fish we're tra we were targeting. This is a blackfish or a luderick nigger, a beautiful specimen, and you can see the bands running through the fish. Notice the very, very small mouth, hence the small hooks we're using. And what we're going to do with this one, we're going to dispatch it fairly quickly and bleed it to get the iodine out of it to make sure we have nice, sweet flesh. Uh, but this is very, very common size in, uh, in a lake like this. And this is the product of uh, probably about an hour's fishing, a good size literary. You gotta do everything yourself, mate. Oh, that's all right. I can edit that part out. <laughs> okay, you can talk if you want. Um well at long last we got a blackfish taken a while but uh, they've just come on the turn on the bite now as the tide comes on the turn we've got a bit of run out water now and I'm getting a lot more downs and eventually scored a good feed take the hook out of him and uh, might be tea tonight
Yeah. You get that, did you? Okay, we've just caught another nice blackfish here. And what I'm going to do, Len, um, we've, we've got enough for a feed. So I'm just going to actually just let him go now because he's, uh, we've got more than we need. So uh, this is a magic little fish and just going to just release him in here now. I'll just swim and make sure he goes. And there he goes. 